Welcome back, T Millers, to the latest episode in the T Mill podcast. I'm Martin T Mill. Today we're joined by a really exciting guest representing the Scottish Society for the Protection of Cruelty to Animals, which is Scotland's animal welfare charity. And we're joined by Jane, not her real name, because uh, she is a um, undercover investigator in the Special Investigations Unit. This is really exciting. It's it's a big issue, um, quite a serious issue. We're going to get into that. Um, but to start with, just want to say welcome. And this is like a pretty badass job. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah. So it t- has its moments. So, yeah. How do, how does that feel? Like you know, because uh, we're we're not we're not actually allowed to um, uh, share your real name or your um, your face. Um, Presumably, your very close family and friends know what you do, um, or, or, or do they? I don't know. And the people that do, like, does it feel kind of badass when you when you say that that's what you do? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, um, of course, yeah, people close to you know what you do, and and a lot of people know that I work for the SSPCA, but they don't actually know what I do for them. They just know that I work in animal welfare, and um, you know, it's not hard sometimes if you know I've maybe been on news. Um, programs where you maybe see the back of my head and hear my voice and I've got quite a distinct voice um so people do know it's me but um yeah people always like oh you know your job sounds really interesting but obviously we don't say too much about how we what we do or how we do it um but yeah people are always interested very interested uh, because it's I suppose it is quite a unique role yeah it's like the special forces of animal welfare I love it. It's, 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 it's like, it's, it's so exciting. Um, okay. So um, the Scottish, uh, the SSPCA, I was reading it earlier, it's starting in 1839. That's a long time yes. ago. And it, it, it's kind, yeah. of, it's kind of interesting that throughout the, this story of uh, people and animals and that relationship going wrong and then having to have other people who are kind of conscientious of that to do something about it sort of like an arms race it's interesting how that's stayed with us through you know and it's the same story isn't it where do you think that that kind of relationship breaks down Uh, in relation to how people are treating animals uh, you're referring to yeah i mean unfortunately there's you can't change human nature and you know we all view things differently and you know how people treat an animal is completely polar opposite to how you or my, I might treat an animal and people have varying levels of what they find acceptable but some people sadly um, you know it's human nature that some people are cruel um, and unfortunately the sad reality is that some people actually take enjoyment um, from what they would class as their sport like badger baiting which is extremely cruel and um, it's horrific and um, people take pleasure in that they get adrenaline rushes and and that is so alien to you or I but unfortunately as there are always going to be you're never going to stop animal cruelty and do you think and do you think like um there's one of the things that I find interesting is you have people who are sort of polar opposite of you from a values point of view and there's this is an interesting middle ground in particular I was, I was reading how uh you know uh, your organization started to improve the welfare of carriage horses particularly and one of the interesting um, sort of fuzzy bits in the middle is where economics perhaps cause people to compromise on, you know, common kind of, you know, what would be quite common values. And um, one of the things that you've been doing recently uh, is working in that area. I think there's a there's a similar uh, story there around the the the, the breeding, uh, the sale and trade of, of puppies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, you know, the illegal puppy trade. Um, which we class it as, um, you know, it's not illegal to breed a litter of pups and sell a litter of pups. You know, people do that. That's not worth concern. But it's always been there that there is money to be made from the sale of pups. Um, Lots of money. And when people are making lots of money, the welfare of animals, um, dogs, pups, is completely compromised because it's quite simply people put profit over welfare. And um, in recent times, we always see um, huge spikes. Um, you know, there's, there's patterns of when the, the sale of puppies escalates, obviously, in the run up to Christmas. Sadly, people will still 
buy a puppy for Christmas. Um, and in the last year, because of the COVID situation, the demand for puppies has gone through the roof. So what you've got there is supply and demand. People want pups. People will breed pups and sell pups. And that's we're not going to be able to stop that. I think it's fascinating, really, because we have a similar story in, uh, you know, from a sustainability point of view, when you try and do the right thing, like sustainable materials, renewable energy gets more expensive and it's actually cheaper to, like, do the wrong thing. It's sort of crazy how cost drives bad it should sort of should be the other way around it's kind of crazy the system re- rewards that so we you know this is um this is a can be quite a distressing issue and we're gonna we're gonna sort of like get on to some of the really positive things that you guys have done in response to it in a second and some of the ways that um you know, kind of uh i think a lot of people listening will be interested in hearing as a charity how you're dealing with modernization the internet technology and stuff but perhaps you could just take us through first like because i'm sure there'll be other people out there like me that are really curious about this what does a typical undercover investigation kind of go like talk us talk us through the kind of process quick like if you can well i mean obviously you know our unit um we deal with serious and organized crime in relation to puppy uh, animal welfare sorry and um, so we we deal with it in a totally different way than our um, uniform inspectors do. Um, we tend to gather intelligence. Um, we will speak to individuals, and then we will build up a picture, and then we will see warrants. Um, that's how we tend to operate. And it, I, I, well, every day is different in our unit. There's so much, you know. We, we our unit cover the whole of Scotland. We sometimes have to travel out with Scotland to investigate welfare matters that that link back to Scotland. But any day can be so different. You know, some it can be quite fun. Like today I'm on a podcast talking to you lovely people. But some days, sadly, I could be analysing a phone where I'm seeing an animal being ripped to bits by dogs. Um some days I could be going and picking up um, dead puppies to take them for post-mortem. But some days, you know, we could be, you know, out there, um, you know, looking at badger sets. There's so much to it. Um, it's a very, very varied. Uh, um, and in half an hour, I would never be able to tell you everything. <laughs> yeah. So it's like one of the things that I find quite interesting in speaking to lots of other charitable organisations is the challenge that people... Uh, like yourself and your colleagues face because of that polarity you see some stuff that is extreme uh, to the average person most days Um, and you also have like a public where you know the truth is most most people um, are responsible pet owners and and um, most people like like pets puppies dogs can be really positive things and people like to think about that so how do you and and they're also exactly the kind of people who'd perhaps be your strongest allies allies sorry so like so like how do you feel like it's a challenge sometimes to communicate um with people uh because you have such strong the tr- you know it's the truth though so, but it's such a strong story how do you how do you think you guys try to you know if you've got a view on that i know it's i know you're more on the investigation side than the communication side but like how do you try and kind of cross that bridge to make sure that people are aware of these issues um without kind of i don't know can you can you make it less sad we i mean we we do have you know our press office work really hard to put stories out there and put information out, out there and we do have the say no to puppy dealers website um so the information's out there unfortunately people you know, it's kind of a an instant world where somebody decides they want a pup and then they, they, they want it that day. They don't want to wait. They don't want to do their research. So they'll just look online. Oh, that's a lovely pup. And then they end up having thousands of pounds of vet bills and maybe not a pup at the end of it. That's the sad reality. So really, it's it, there are difficulties in raising awareness to the public so that they know that this is going on. However, in recent times, because there has been a surge um, in people having pups that have been extremely ill and dying, um, which happens a lot, but lately it's been relentless. We get uh, numerous calls every day. And because there is press and media interest in that, 
you know, we are we are trying to work with the media and we are trying to get that message out there. Look, this is the reality. It is unfortunately the reality. And, we, it, you know, it can be quite a harsh message to get out there. But we need to get out there and we need to get people to listen. And that's, you know, why things like this are really important. So so on that, I think if I, if I can, I wonder if you... I was thinking about this when I was coming over here to talk to you today. It sort of seems like there's a... Par- something that I think about is the parallels between, um, like, biodiversity... Uh, the environment and and like the David Attenborough things like been amazing because people have been started paying more attention to the natural world. But do you think that that one of the root causes of this is there's kind of like a disconnect perhaps between between like you know we buy like people buy like a fizzy pop but not think about the plastic pollution or in co- in lockdown see a uh, you know an Instagram post of a lovely puppy puppy but not think about all the poops you got a scoop. So so how do we sort of like connect that back? back up do you think it's that people don't sort of just don't care or they just don't know is there like an educational solution what does a solution look like in your mind i think you do have things like you know social media can be a blessing and a curse so for example you know you might get a video of an animal you know like a slow loris being tickled under its arms and it looks cute but that's it's extremely cruel and it's an extremely cruel trade so people look at that and go oh i want one of them or you know, there's things like that. So when people look at puppies, you know, there's all these um, cute cro- crossbreeds and everybody goes, oh, I want that one, I want that teddy bear, I want this. But they, they are kind of blind and maybe blinkered when it comes to the, the realities of it because probably everybody thinks that will not happen to me. That will not happen to me. And let me tell you, it does happen. Um, so... It really is. It's about trying to hit home that message and get it through to people. But unfortunately, sometimes there's just that disconnect and it's really, really not happening. You know, we would never blame an individual for buying a pup that is out, but we still have to put some onus on the public to let them be aware. Don't just go out and buy a pup. You wouldn't hand a stranger three thousand pounds for for a car that you haven't looked at so why would you do that just because you see a cute pup you know it's a bit and that sounds harsh but it's facts and so uh, another thing that i wanted to talk about was um quite often organizations like you guys um have kind of i think i mean tell me if i'm wrong but sort of like two sides it's like the work that you do which is like the really important bit and that's why why what gets you up in the morning and you have another side which is the kind of bit that um, helps raise awareness and funds to make sure that that work can can, can continue, and in it, it, all all the while through time, it feels like there's a kind of this arms race thing because the world changes, there's new technologies, um, and the internet is all around us, isn't it? It's everywhere, and and in recent times, uh, you say it's quite an interesting point you make. It's a blessing in a disguise. I'm just sort of like curious as to what uh, changes you've seen over the years where the internet's become more uh, prevalent i think there was something you were talking about with um rented properties you talked about you know, something that the public can do is make sure they do a background check on the breeder to make sure the puppies have been really properly taken care of before they bring them into their family but but the uh people are people are doing things with rented properties trying to see if people can you tell us a little bit about that and how you're using the internet um in your work Obviously, um, the internet is, it opens up the whole world and everything's there, um, instant, everything's instant. And um, you see online selling sites um, that advertise pups, you know, you, you'll see thousands of pups um, over a couple of different internet selling sites. So people think, oh, I want a pup. They go onto the internet and there's a pup. Um, so but what's happening as well, because of the COVID situation, the prices have been gouged, you know, exponentially. It's through the roof and people are paying it. So if people are paying it, the prices will go up because people suddenly, oh, I'm furloughed, I could raise a pup. So what's happening is um, pups that would normally go, even pups that would be two, three hundred pounds before are now fourteen hundred pounds. So what's happening is for for talking sake, you know, I don't want to give people ideas about money that can be made, but you've got a litter of 10 pops and you're selling 10 pops for £1,500. You know, there's very, very minimal outlay for that. 
So to make it more viable um, and make it more realistic to a buyer, they will rent cheap rental accommodations for a couple of days because £100, £200 is a drop in the ocean when you're earning £15,000 from one litter of pups. So so a, a person will say, oh, I'll turn up at um, this address. Oh, this looks like a lovely house or a nice flat. Or, and then they go in and, and it's, oh, right, here's your puppy. And um, and let me tell you, though, even when people do that, they will say that, oh, there was red flags. There was loads of red flags. But they choose to ignore that because the simple fact of the matter is puppies and kittens and animals grab your heart. And you, you're clouded, you know, sense and reasoning goes out the window when it comes to buying a wee cute pup. And, um, and that's what we need to make people aware of. And people will, you know, with the best intention say, oh, I couldn't leave that puppy with them. Yeah, of course you couldn't. And that's lovely. But you've just handed over £1,500. You are now paying a £1,000 in vet bills. Your puppy's dead. And that person has got £1,500 pounds of your money in the back pocket so that's perpetuating the trade so people need to walk away they need to learn to walk away but unfortunately they don't and call you guys yeah yeah it's fascinating isn't it i think that's completely crazy that you can see you can it sort of makes sense like you know there's inflated prices attract perhaps the wrong types of characters and then just i mean it's, it's such a shame how innovation can be and technology can be used like i think if you're like broadly like good-hearted person you just think of innovation technology as good but actually it's just amplifies whatever values you've got it's sort of crazy how people are using technology like innovating coming up with like holiday home rentals for this purpose it's bananas so let's let's talk about perhaps some of the ways that you guys have been using technology positively and you know, the purpose of these podcasts not really talk about tmail too much it's more just to sort of hear about you know the and get sort of some inspiration to to tackle i think a lot of issues that we all share in common the internet the environment you know trying to make our world a better place but um you guys have been using technology uh in your own organization like with your your store and um your team of store and it's kind of like cool how uh on the uh fundraising awareness side you know you've been enga- engaging people and, and there's something that strikes me about your store is it's very positive so do you, do you have a view on why you think that's important? Absolutely, because we don't want everything to be, you know, doom and gloom. You know, we want people, you know, to have a, a good story, an uplifting story. And, 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 you know, there are positives. We do have great successes. And and through things like, you know, like so your sales team out, you're producing um, great products that have got a message and, and and that raises awareness and makes people stop and think um, you know, our press office you know, they, they really um, we've got some great stories that we can pass um, as well as the negative and, and when people you know, hear a positive outcome they, you know, they, they realise that they can make a difference, we can make a difference to animals' lives and and you know, that can be through the internet, through media, through doing things like this. You know, it, it's getting the getting the good stuff out there is really just as important as the negative. I quite like how products kind of cross over the internet. It can feel, you know what I mean, and, and become real, like a memento and also a conversation starter. Yeah. The connection that I think people should make between the work you're doing with awareness and fundraising and your investigations is that something, because you're, you're like on the ground actually doing it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of not often you, we get to speak to someone like yourself that's like really doing the work. Does that, how does that money make a difference? Just for the, the society to function on a daily basis, it costs roughly £46,000. A day? That we need a day. Whoa. Um, yeah, because it's not just um, enforcement work, because what you've got to understand as well, um, the Scottish SPC are quite unique compared to animal charities, um, you know, in the rest of the UK because we actually have reporting powers. So we actually report to the procurator fiscal. Um, other animal charities will take several actions. We don't. We have, you know, statutory reporting powers so we can get results in court. But, um, you know, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of 
money. Um, you have the centres all across Scotland. Um, as, if you can imagine the amount of staff it takes, the amount of animals that are in there. You know, we have a huge, huge education department that, you know, we, we deal with school kids. We have... we, we carry out lots of studies um you know we don't just go out and um on the ground and you know speak to individuals look at animals seize animals we actually do a lot of um scientific research there's just so much to the society and 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 it does take a lot of money to keep that going and we do rely on the the lovely general public um to support us in that i think it's interesting when when you and you explain some of the more like the powers that you've got on the scale of your operation actually it, it's that's quite cheap yeah Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> kind of it's like a pseudo police force for animals yeah almost i mean the police um, when anything you know um we work very very closely with police scotland we actually work closely with a lot of um external agencies because we have an um you know uh, uh, something called operation delphin where we work with the ports authorities we work with dumfries and galloway council we work with, with ireland southern ireland england and it's like other charities we all come together to try and stop the illegal puppy trade but in scotland what you tend to find that happens is if someone calls the police regarding animal cruelty they will refer that to the sspca because because we are the people that deal with that every day we have the, the ability to seize animals we've you know so we work really closely with the police with that and then um, you know it's a wee bit of a symbiotic relationship if you like one of the things that I take from this is how important um, and how how people out there who care about this stuff can kind of do something to support people like you, even if it's as simple as like liking, sharing, or starting a conversation on the internet. Um, that's that that does make a difference to what actually happens. You know, the people like you that are doing the important stuff on on the ground. Perhaps we could um, leave the conversation with you. You you sharing with us um, like a. a a success story and then you know one thing that everyone can just kind of remember that that you know to to do if they find themselves in a situation like this like you know you got a story you can share with us where things went really great and we got a great outcome yeah we um we had um, an investigation in the northeast of scotland regarding a large-scale puppy dealer um who uh, was Breeding pups, um, some were are brought in from other countries, but um, had a huge illegal breeding establishment and um, had been banned um, for, had a previous ban disqualification because of illegal puppy dealing. Um, the, the disqualification um, was gone and he continued and um, hugely, hugely compromised welfare of animals. Um, so our team, assisted by Police Scotland, um, went in and we seized over 100 animals. Um, 87 of them were dogs, puppies, um, some cats, some uh, rabbits. Um, and basically, the, the conditions were appalling. You had um, cramped cages full of dogs and puppies, um, unsanitary conditions. A lot of the puppies and dogs didn't make it, sadly. This is a sad reality. However, um, this resulted in that individual going to jail and being disqualified. And we got all the animals. Um, and the ones that, that survived um, were rehomed into fabulous homes. And, um, you know, and that put a stop to that. Um, so we do have successes. We have successes at court. Um, you know, it doesn't always happen. Um, but, you know, we work really hard. And if we are going in somewhere with a warrant, you know, we've done our homework. You know, we know what we're going into. And um, so, yeah, it's um, we have successes like that. That's a, fa- that's a really inspiring story. Great. <laughs> Love that. And, you know, there's some puppies out there that are, you know, um, running around on beaches because of that work. Fantastic. Um, so we can all kind of like, you know, support organiz- charitable organisations like yours, starting a conversation, you know, sharing it, using the time that we spend on the internet constructively. One thing for everyone to kind of rem- take from it, watch out for, you know, like uh, some, some sounds like something around just sort of thinking when you're at that point where you're thinking about 
get an A pet perhaps? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the information and what not to do is out there. Don't act impulsively. Don't just because you want a pup or even a kitten, because um, they, we're seeing the trade in that increase as well. Um, just think about what what would you normally do if you were buying something at two thousand pounds? You wouldn't just readily hand over the money. So don't do it with a living, breathing creature. Now, go on to our Say No to Puppy Dealer website. The information's there. But be very, very careful, um, you know, if you're going on to internet selling sites um, because they they will promise you the earth and they will always say things like, oh, five-star homes and, you know, different things. But you'll always find red flags when you're looking at things. They'll maybe have a different name and then they'll have a different number when you contact them or they'll not tell you their name. Um, and they'll maybe be quite vague about information. Trust your instincts. And if you do go to a property, even Google the property and, and it will tell you if it's, a, you know, a rental accommodation, a holiday home. So there are lots of red flags to look. Do not allow someone to bring a pup to your home. Do not allow them to use COVID as an excuse. Do not allow someone to meet you in a car park. It's actually an offence to sell in a public place. You know, so if somebody sells you a pup in a car park, they're committing an offence. So, so you need to do your research. Always when you're looking for to, to purchase any animal, whether it be a puppy, cat, horse, anything, do your research on the breeder. You know, speak to people who have brought pups from them. Don't just buy from a random stranger who won't even tell you their name. Thanks very much for that. I think there's a, such an interesting common theme um, in people like yourselves working in these kind of really important areas, thinking about the way that we use the internet, thinking about the way that we use the money that we've got and making sure that we're conscientiously uh, doing both to make sure that we get the results that we really, that kind of really we really want to see in the world. Um, such an inspiring and interesting conversation. The name's Bond, Jane Bond. Double <laughs> uh, six and a half. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing sharing your story. Um, it's it's great for us to hear experiences from people who are, um, you know, uh, using a little bit of the tech that we've made alongside the the, the work that they they do um, and doing such important important things in the world that people people might not be uh, aware of. So thanks very much for the work that you do on behalf of all dog and cat lovers and and so on out there. It's really inspiring, and um, yeah, we 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 wish you all the best, and you know, I'm sure. It, uh, all of the listeners are right behind you. No, yeah, thank you. And thank you for your support. You know, um, it's really important to us. Your products are fantastic. And, you know, you're really helping us and helping us on the ground. We really appreciate it. Thank you.